I often say that heresy is in the eye of the beholder. We're going to talk about some of those beholders tonight, and we're going to talk about the heresiologists coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony, and joining me to talk about the heresiologist is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. How's it going? Oh, it's going good. Well, you know, as good as it can, life in the Kenoma. That's but uh, it's actually just a concentrated <laughs> suffering. But besides that, it's going good right now because we have uh, an amazing show with an amazing guest tonight. That's right, and our guest tonight is Dr. David Litva, who is uh, joining us to talk about uh, heresiologists and, uh, on, and why are they so mean. So welcome, Dr. Litva, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. All it's right. a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you. So let's jump right into it. Um, one of the big ones, uh, uh, Hippolytus, uh, wrote a, uh, a book about heresy and uh, how much he disliked it, The Refutation of All Heresies. Why don't you give us an overview of what that book is about and who Hippolytus was and all that good stuff. Well, uh, I appreciate you asking that question. That's that's where we begin. That's where most people begin mm -hmm. um, with Hippolytus. The book that I published uh, just this year is called The Refutation of All Heresies, and it's traditionally uh, attributed to Hippolytus, but that authorship is uh, wrong. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's disputed and uh, by most critical scholars now uh, do not attribute it to Hippolytus. Hippolytus, uh, that theory was built up in the late 19th century and unfortunately it didn't have a lot of evidence. So the first thing to kind of let your viewers know about the refutation of all heresies is that we actually don't know who the author is. Ah. Now he was identified with Hippolytus who is a, a real dude uh, in the East, uh, supposedly a bishop or some kind of leader of the church, but he was identified with this Roman writer of the refutation of all heresies. And the problem with that is it was on very slim evidence. And so today we let the author of the refutation just be the author of the refutation and a couple other works. Uh, and I follow scholarly practice in not calling him Apollodus, but that doesn't take away from any of his significance. In fact, mm -hmm. this figure in Rome claimed to be the high priest, uh, which is a title that only the bishops of Rome used. So we know that this figure was competing for the chief place in Rome. And in the late 19th century, he was even called Gegenpopst, which means anti-pope. That mm -hmm. is the first uh, we had the first royal duel in the Catholic Church where we had two popes. Now, that's um, a bit of a misnomer because the papal uh, theology hadn't really developed. What we do yeah. have, though, is two figures who claim to be in charge of something called the universal church, which is just... Catholicy in Greek, the Catholic Church. So he's a major player, he's a major figure, and ironically, we don't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> but the reputation of all heresies, one of the reasons why we think we don't know his name is because that name was suppressed, because this figure became so dangerous later in church history, and we only have this from one manuscript, that is most of the Refutation of All Heresies, which was found by chance <laughs> in the in the mid 19th century in a monastery at Mount Athos. And it is a bad looking manuscript. They did not take care of this. Mm. So it is an absolute blessing that we have this. We're really not supposed to have this. But what's in this book is a loaded cart of all different sorts of uh, meals, so to speak. That is, all different sorts of uh, magic, Gnostic groups, uh, philosophical groups, um, interesting stories about church politics, and a lot of uh, information that we don't have from anywhere else 
in Greek, which is in the native language of those Gnostics or whatever we want to call them, they're speaking in Greek, not in translation, so it's not like the Nagamati Library. Mm -hmm. We've got them in their own words. And the author is proud of the fact that he's copied his enemies in their own words because, as he says, he thinks their own words refute them. To us, it's a different story. Yes, that's uh, that's common among the heresiologists, right? Irenaeus is renowned for doing that as well, and uh, quoting large passages from the people he doesn't like, saying, look at these idiots over here. Can you believe that this is what they're teaching? <laughs> well, Irenaeus it has uh, the reputation of being a kind of chief heresiologist. He's actually, and if you look at book one of, of his uh, Against All Heresies, he doesn't actually quote a lot directly. He's a paraphraser. He mm. describes, people think fairly accurately, what some of these, in this case, um, Valentinian Gnostic systems look like. Yeah. The reason why the refutation of all heresies is so much different, and I think more important than Irenaeus, is because he actually gives us, in their own words, with very little paraphrase and very little intervention, all of these different groups that we knew nothing about apart from this document. Uh, and about how I, I find it a, a fascinating work, and uh, unfortunately, I have your your book on order through uh, interlibrary loan, and it hasn't come yet. So I read <laughs> the the, the shaft translation, you know, uh, which which by uh -huh. the way is just a simply dreadful translation. But the, <laughs> the, I, I hate I hated reading it, but I still loved it because it's it's such a fascinating work. Uh, right. How many how many groups approximately does he cover in the uh, in the book? Well, he covers, uh, I believe it's at least two dozen separate groups or thinkers. But what's really exciting about this group is he gives us what's called in German the Gnostic Sondergut. That is eight, uh, eight blocks of material from groups and thinkers that we never knew existed. And again, it's in their own words. And he's very precise about the works that these are coming from. And so the great thing about the refutation of all heresies is that it brings us the Gnostic voice in their own voice. And it's stuff that we get nowhere else. Yeah. Earlier you said that the uh, this is a book we're not supposed to be re uh, reading. It's been forgotten for a reason. And we just had the one manuscript. It, is your theory because... That, that the author was was this mover and shaker and was having these problems uh, with the communities at the time, or does it have to do with the content? Because it's described in such detail and so well, even though he's saying these are bad things and these are silly, where were people not copying it and distributing it because they were worrying that people would read this and become fascinated, interested in it. Why, why do you think that this text was mostly forgotten uh, and not copied or distributed? Well, I, it's a great question, and I think it's a mix of both. Um, uh, to be precise, we do have five copies of book one, which is a kind of philosophical summary. But the real dangerous material, books four through ten, uh, yeah, we only have one manuscript, uh, very few fragments. And what I think, uh, if I can give my own kind of theory, went on is in book nine, it is a very entertaining, very, very fascinating, but utterly uh, destructive bombast against the current Bishop of Rome, who was named Callistus. And he, what our author does in the refutation is he takes apart Callistus morally, ethically, economically, and destroys him. It is the most... Uh, gruesome character sketch of any figure known to be a pope, I think, in all of ancient writings. And so this this book, which was book nine, I think really became dangerous uh, to be copied by anyone who, after this author, wanted to be part of or a member of what was called the Universal or Catholic Ecclesia, the, the Universal Church. And so, yes, it was dangerous. And Yes, the author does warn people reading the book that he's copying out this material in order to destroy his enemies, but he says that 
and particularly to the young, he says, you know, listen, um, I don't want you to be taken in by what they're actually saying. Uh, I want you to listen to me. Uh, but the, the, he gives their own words, which he thinks are self-refuting, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the let's move on from refutation of all heresies. Let's talk about uh, briefly some of the other works uh, of, of the heresy hunters of the early church. Um, what can you tell us about, uh, really really briefly, as, as briefly as you can, uh, somebody sure. like Tertullian, uh, Tertullian, Origen, and Irenaeus? So all of these thinkers are united by a common uh, uh, ploy, I guess, or a common argument, and that is that they're Christian enemies, and most of the Gnostics they were dealing with were fellow Christians. The argument that they all pull in common, uh, the refutation very much so, uh, starting this pattern, the argument is that the Christian enemies, so-called Gnostics, are pulling information from mystery cults and philosophical groups and uh, magic, magical practitioners, and that from this material, they are developing their form of Christianity. In other words, it's, it's an argument which tries to poison the well, so to speak, mm. uh, and say that, hey, yeah, there's some... Uh, some interesting, enticing stuff in what they're saying, but actually their content is from these uh, evil sources. Uh, again, philosophers and mystery cults and magical practitioners. And the re author of the refutation adds astrology to that. Mm. Now, what's interesting is, <laughs> as an argument, this is actually, some people in the ancient world, some people in the modern world actually find this convincing. What seems to be the case is that early Christians were pulling anywhere and everywhere right. in order to make their teaching and spirituality persuasive. And what we see in these Gnostic writers are just some of the most explorative and open-minded Christians that we've ever seen. So in other words... Uh their syncretism is bad, but ours is okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, you know, it, even calling it syncretism it, it is it, it, a bit of a loaded term that heresiologists could use in terms of, you know, that, that, that mixing things together is bad. Mm -hmm. But in mm -hmm. fact, as you're right, that that's what we all do. We're mm -hmm. all hybrids, so to speak, mm -hmm. in, our, in, our, in our way we think about faith and spirituality. And uh, some of us just misrecognize that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, let us uh, let's draw a line there and uh, and get into some more detail in the podcast version. Um, we got a lot more questions, but I don't want to start sure. a new one and run out of time here. So, uh, thank you once again, uh, David Litva, for joining us uh, on the show and. Um, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Department of uh, Religious Studies. I don't have that in front of me, unfortunately, the specifics, but um, it's been on the screen a couple of times, so you can go back. Where would you like to send people if they want to find out more about you and your work on the Internet? So I do have a blog. It's just mdavidlitwa uh, at WordPress, and uh, they can find out more information uh, about some of my books and research. Uh, and that would probably be the best place. I encourage people to email me if they have any questions or, or whatever. All right. Fantastic. So thank you again. And uh, please stick around, everybody, for a couple of days for the podcast, which will come out a few days from the release of this video. And for those of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. Good night. Good night. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.